Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the COVID-19 2.0 Health Literacy ECHO for medical providers, brought to you by Health Confianza, a collaboration between the UT Health San Antonio and the San Antonio Metropolitan Health District. Thank you very much for making this time one of your priority and join us in our session today. Um, I would like to mention that we are recording this session so we can share it later, but please know that anything listed in the chat will be seen in our recording. My name is Raquel Romero. I am so glad to see you and I hope you and your family are doing well. I'm a physician by training and I'm gonna be the facilitator for the ECHO session today. We have a lot of information to cover, but before we begin, I would like to ask our UT ECHO IT person to provide some directions for us. Thank you so much, Carly. Hi, um, please stay muted unless you're speaking. You can use star six on your phone if you call in or the microphone icon on the bottom left of your screen. If you join on the computer, you can also communicate with the chat feature. If you're having issues with your connection, you can privately chat UT Echo IT. Thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, thank you very much for these instructions, Carly. Additionally, please remember if you have some issues with the connection, you can add your comment in the chat box or you can send a private message to the UT Echo IT. We would like to hear from you and I invite you and encourage you to add your comments, your perspectives, your questions and suggestions in the chat box. We will try to follow up then during the session today. You can also reach out to us after this session by email and we promote interaction in our sessions and we love to see everyone faces. If you're able and comfortable, I invite you to join us by video, especially in the discussion part of the session. And please remember that our personal health information is allowed within discussing cases and scenarios. There is uh, in our group, I would like to ask you if for our attendance records, uh, if you please add your name, your title, contact information, institution, and organization in our chat box. This is for our attendance records. Health Confianza is a countywide collaboration to improve access and the uses of the COVID-19 health information and services in Beja County. With that, and before we started, I would like to introduce our COVID-19 Health Literacy Echo team. And I would like to start with Dr. Bergen. Good afternoon, welcome everybody. My name is Dr. Ruth Bergeron. I am a professor of medicine and infectious diseases. I'm a proud member of the Health Confianza team and I will be helping to moderate this session today. I'm looking forward to a presenting, uh, to having Dr. Adelita Cantu present a case for us. And I'm looking forward to receiving cases from all of you who are here today for next time session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bergen. Yeah, if, please consider to present a cases in our session. If you already present a case, you can always present a follow-up. We would like to hear from your experience. We have also uh, Dr. Adelita Cantu, case presenter. Sorry, getting off mute there. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adelita Kentu, Associate Professor for UT Health San Antonio School of Nursing, and great to be here to uh, share some of my experiences with um, COVID-19 and what people are saying in the community. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's presenting the case for today. Dr. Rosenfeld, didactic presenter. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Jason Rosenfeld. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine. I also uh, direct our global health education program, and then I'm honored to be the implementing director for the Health Confianza Project and really excited to share space and time with you all this afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Jimenez Gutierrez, panelist. Uh, maybe she's gonna join Wait, us. She's not able to make it, unfortunately. She sent her regrets. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Case. Hi, I'm Dr. Uh, Katie Case, and I'm assistant professor at the REACH Center um, uh, at UT Health San Antonio. Um, and this is actually my last meeting, so it's good to see everyone. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for joining us our session today. Thank you for all your help, and thank you for our ECHO team to make those sessions possible. Um, we have some announcements. In as of October 12th, the FDA has approved the new COVID-19 bivalent booster for um, five and up for Pfizer and six and up for Moderna. We have prepared some resource information um, that is gonna be in the chat. Carly, would you please share that information? Uh, 
in the chat. Also, this information is gonna be available in our resource um, center for the session today. Um, I also would like to mention that these sessions are possible because of you, because your interest, your participation, and, and your support. And again, thank you so much for joining our session today. Toward the end of the session, our team will send you a link for evaluation. Uh, would you please take a moment and complete that evaluation and provide this feedback to us? And we're always looking for clinics and organizations and physicians to participate in these eco sessions. If you know, uh, a physician organization or institution that would like to join at our ECHO sessions, we would like to contact them. ECHO stands for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes. This is a model of learning opportunity and mentorship. The goal is to bring the knowledge when it's needed, where it's needed, and to build community capacity for delivering best practice. Okay. Our components are the didactics, the case discussion, and a conversation. The case discussion is an important component of the ECHO model. Carly is sharing right now the announcements that we open up about the approval of the COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you so much, Carly. Um, I and the information is gonna be also in our website as well as in the chat, the information. Um, ECOIT will also add in the chat instructions on how to submit a case. And for those that already present a case, uh, please consider to present a follow-up. We would like to hear from your experience. Uh, please check out our website to learn more about the ECHO model and ongoing ECHO programs for uh, ECHO series. For this ECHO series, we're offering the CME, the CNE, and Ethics Continuing Medical Education. To obtain those credits, please follow up the instructions in the chat. And the activity code for today is 1009294. Finally, I would like to mention that ECHO is all teach online environment. So we encourage you to share your experience, questions, and insight in our conversation. We know more from my end. I would like to start with our didactic, Dr. Rosenfield. This is your space. Please take it away when you're ready. Could I be given hosting capability to share my screen, please? All right. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. It is so nice to be with you uh, today. Um, I'm going to be talking today about how do we effectively combat anti-science and can we help ourselves to become effective COVID-19 mythbusters. Um, so here are some of the details that uh, Dr. Romero was just talking about with CME and CNE. We'll have more of this to share later. Um, I have no disclosures to share other than um, recognizing the Department of Health and Human Services for funding uh, the full Health Confianza project, which includes this ECHO series, the ECHO series that we're hosting with community health workers and other community-based health promotion activities, as well as our organizational pledge program. So today, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about um, some definitions and then talk a little bit about online health literacy, since many of the, the sources of mis and disinformation spreading around COVID-19, as well as other health topics for that matter, um, originate online and then are spread online. And then I want to talk to you about this idea of misinformation inoculation. How can we prepare our patients and or community members that we're speaking with um, for mis and disinformation so that they can better navigate and ultimately, as with everything we do in Health Confianza, make the best decisions for themselves. We'll talk a little bit about some common myths, and then I'm going to tie in some of our core communication skills that we've been talking about throughout this health literacy program, this ECHO, um, to this idea of myth, misinformation inoculation. So the objectives today, learn how to help our patients discern whether they're getting legitimate information online about COVID-19. I wanna talk about two or three common myths that circulate on social media or online, and then talk about how do we use active listening 
in this concept of respectful bridging to speak with people about COVID myths. And if we've got time and interest, I'll even invite you to do some role playing with us. But that I think we'll probably spend more time talking about the cases. So I do enjoy audience participation. So I'm going to ask some folks either via the chat or if you're willing to unmute, help me define these terms. And you can choose whichever one you would like to define. But I need somebody to define information, somebody to define rumor, myth, misinformation, and disinformation. Who would like to go first? Please don't be shy. You can choose or else I'm going to start calling on you. Can anyone def define information for us? It's a quiet group today. I'm going to put one of our, our hub team members. Can somebody help us break the ice? Well, information is um, knowledge, but we particularly refer to it when we're kind of transmitting knowledge from one source to another source. Great. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Berger, and I appreciate that. And Ricardo has shared in the chat, and then Dan, I'll get to you in just a moment, Dr. Dean. Um, Ricardo shared in the chat, misinformation is inf incorrect information. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Dean? I just was going to say that um, they're all information. It's just whether the level of uh, accuracy and truth involved in formulating the information. Yeah. That, that's a great, yeah, it's a great way to put it, right? All of it, as Dr. Berger had said, is information. It's communication, and some of it is incorrect some of it may be correct as um again in the chat let me make this a little bigger for myself ricardo says disinformation is intentionally wrong information uh, veronica mentions information should be evidence-based yeah exactly right and this is a key piece of this is to think about the primarily the difference between misinformation and disinformation because as we said misinformation can be an accidental untruth wrong or misleading information and we know that that gets spread all the time but disinformation is purposefully spreading wrong information usually with some sort of political economic or personal agenda and i think we would all agree that there's been a lot of disinformation being spread over the last couple of years um, around COVID-19 vaccines and other issues around the pandemic. So thank you so much for your participation. It's always good to, to hear from folks. So how big of a problem is this? Now, this data is a little bit outdated, but the challenge is, is there's still not a lot of good research happening in this space. So back in October of 2021, the Kaiser Family Foundation did this survey and they found that 78% of the people that they sampled said that they had heard at least one of the myths that's listed on this uh, on this slide. And they either say it's true or they're not sure whether or not this piece of information is true. And so the biggest driver of this was the government exaggerating the number of COVID-19 deaths. Around 38% of people said it, they'd heard it and they believed it was true, with an additional 22% saying they had heard it, but they didn't know if it was true. The point of this is to say that B beliefs and, and access to myths and misinformation is high and beliefs in those uh, pieces of information are also high. So we have a challenge in front of us as public health practitioners and communicators to overcome this issue. And so when we think about um, communicating in science, uh, Dr. Hotez wrote a paper earlier this year on communicating science and protecting scientists in a time of political inst instability. And what he has documented is about anti-vaccine aggression has killed about 250 thousand unvaccinated Americans during the second half of 2021. And many people who are refusing to get vaccinated are individuals who are victims of mis or disinformation. And while we tend to put throw blame at the social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, the truth is they're not generating the content. They are just a platform by which the content is being generated. And in fact, 65% of vaccine anti-vaccine content can be traced to leading online anti-vaxxers who, according to the Center for Countering Digital Hate, have labeled as the disinformation dozen. And these include Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Joseph Mercola, who's an osteopathic physician, and Charlene Bollinger, who's a misinformation peddler. So there are primary sources of creating this misinformation and disinformation that then gets spread far and wide online um, and through social media uh, 
sites. But we also know that state actors have been involved in this and then also being driven by political extremism in the United States. So if we know that this information is being spread online and it's being circulated and uh, helping people gain access to mis and disinformation, the question is, how do we then identify trustworthy sources? So I want to walk you through a very simple mnemonic that we can use in our minds and help our patients and our community navigate primarily the online uh, resources to begin with. And then I want to show you a resource that you can play with to understand the social media environment. So this idea of, is your web literature legit? And so this mnemonic, legit, when was the last review of the website? Is it up to date? Why does it exist? Is this website trying to sell me something? Is the data good? Is it a credible source? Can you trust it? What is the information source? Is it based on research? Is it based on data? Or is it somebody's opinion? And then ultimately, what are they promising you? Is it too good to be true? Are they telling you that the COVID vaccine is going to end, is going to like, prevent you from ever getting COVID as well as the influenza strain, then, then they're probably misleading you. And so these are the questions that you can ask yourself when looking at online content. Legit. Keep that in mind. Um, and then you can help people kind of understand and navigate and maybe ask more questions about the website and the information that they're seeing, ideally driving people towards more trustworthy sites. Um, the other thing you can think about is there are specific URLs or endings that we can think of at the end of our website links that typically have more trustworthy information. These are the .orgs, the .govs, and the .edus. .orgs are usually affiliated with nonprofit organizations and foundations. .gov is clearly government resources, whether they're federal, state, or local. Um, and then .edu are universities, academic uh, institutes of academic um, excellence. Um, the, the sites that you do have to be a little bit weary of are the dot coms. These are your commercial businesses and oftentimes those are driving an agenda associated with that business. But typically I would say you can trust the ORGs, the dot govs, the dot edus, and you should be questioning, uh, not questioning, but looking more deeply at what comes from dot coms, dot nets, and any other affiliated websites. In terms of the social media side, there's not a whole lot of um, guidance out there, but I wanted to introduce you to this game that you can go to to understand the six steps that um, that peddlers of misinformation and disinformation using social media are trying to engage with. And the first is polarizing. So they're finding existing grievances and blowing them out of proportion to get you to think about something that maybe is part of their agenda. Oftentimes they'll use trolling, which is uh, evoking an emotional response like anger or irritation or something, poking the bear, basically. Um, they'll try to discredit people, um, especially if, uh, if they're countering anything that they believe or want to, to promote. They'll oftentimes use emotional triggers, so playing on fear, anger, and compassion to spread a message. A lot of times they're deeping, deep diving into conspiracy theories and people's desire to uncover the quote unquote truth or lure them into other um, uh, other alternative facts as we've come to know them. And then finally, using impersonation, using somebody else's name, likeness or otherwise to promote a message and then getting that information out there. Anyway, this is an interesting game. If you've got some free time, which I know all of us have tons of free time these days, but click on it and you can play the game and understand how information online particularly via social media, gets spread in these tools that people are using. So we've talked about the challenges. We've talked about um, so where these, these sources of information are coming from. Now let's talk about how we can actually engage meaningfully in myth busting with our patients or the communities that we're serving. So I don't know if anybody else, but I was a huge fan of the show Mythbusters. And I love this idea of taking what is given to us and testing it out, right? And that's ultimately what I want us to think about when we're talking about myths, misinformation, and disinformation with our community. So I want to start with just a little bit of data. So there's been a couple of trials that happened in the last couple of years in 2022 um, in 2021, looking at what are the effective techniques for actually trying to bust myths that people are sharing. And so one was done in UK, one was in Australia, and the, the, the techniques that they were testing was question and answer. So basically asking people questions and having them answer, providing just the fact, but then also saying, here's the fact and the potential myth that it's associated with. In Australia, they had posing questions, repeating 
repeating the myths back to people, but then also just repeating factual statements. And ultimately what these two studies found is that the question and answer and posing questions were the most effective at helping people address those myths and overcome them. What they found interestingly was that there was no negative effects of repeating the myths. And I mentioned this because if you go into the literature on this, there is a lot of um, recommendations about trying not to repeat the myth, right? Don't say that there's microchips in the vaccines because then it plants the idea in people's minds and then maybe it's harder to get out. But what this study found, at least within these smaller samples, was that that actually wasn't the case, that if you were able to have a conversation with folks that you could direct them towards factually information. And then I just found this study during my week of preparation for this session on pre-bunking or this idea of message inoculation. So in Canada earlier this year, they did an experiment with pre-post design with two, two and a half thousand English and free French speaking participants, where they put them into, they just got misinformation, they were pre-bunked, and I'll explain that in a minute, where you prepare them for the misinformation first and then give them the misinformation. Um, and then finally, they had a control group and their primary outcome was intention to vaccinate. And what they found here was that the group that was just getting disinformation, either on the mRNA vaccines or quick approval, they were more likely to refuse vaccination than the folks who had the pre-bunking or the inoculation prior to the delivery of misinformation. And then the control group was they weren't influenced at all, which is kind of what you would expect, right? Because they didn't hear any of these, these misleading statements. So the point of this is that we can actually make an uh, impact on our community by pre-bunking, by inoculating people with misinformation prior to their receiving it. So this is the idea of misinformation inoculation. We present a fact we give people a warning about an alternative piece of information they may hear that is associated with that fact or related to it. You then explain to them the fallacy. This is what they are trying to do to get you to be fearful or otherwise. And then you sandwich it back with your fact again. And this strategy originates from social psychology. And the idea is that just like vaccines trigger an immune response, the antibodies that, um, that we generate from the vaccine, we can generate a similar kind of cognitive immune response by preparing people to hear these types of myths and misinformation, but importantly, making sure that you highlight the why. Uh, what are they doing to actually try to leverage your fear, your anxiety, or otherwise that would then uh, lead you to believing this? And so the idea is you give them that weakened example so that you can actually um, lead them towards the fact that you would like to hear. And I'm just going to share one quick example here. So you could start with somebody. They say, you know, the fact is COVID-19 vaccines do not themselves cause COVID-19. The warning is you will hear many people saying that you will get covid 19 if you get the vaccine. Um, thus, there's no reason to get vaccinated because you're just going to get it anyway. And so this is a misrepresentation of the way that COVID-19 vaccines work. And this is targeting people's fears about the new vaccine and particularly the technology of the mRNA. And I think we've already unpacked the mRNA vaccines in prior sessions, so I'm not going to spend time on that here. But then you come back to say the vaccines cannot make you sick because the mRNA vaccines provide your body with instructions on how to build the spike protein. And that is it. There is no virus um, debilitated or otherwise that is put into there, into your body. And we use those instructions to create an immune response to fight the spike protein itself. Fact, misinformation, the warning, the fallacy, what are they doing? What fear are they pack packing into? And then ultimately coming back to your fact. And if you're going to engage in information, misinformation, inoculation, or pre-bunking is another term that we've heard, then you really have to use two core communication skills. The first is active listening. You must go into the conversation with your eyes and ears open without judgment and to hear what people are saying. Show them that you care about what you're hearing and that you can understand that others have shared something similar. And if you start from that place and you're not seeking to win the conversation, then you can actually begin to nudge people towards vaccine confidence and ultimately adoption if that's what we're talking about. You can use this for a whole variety of, reasons, uh, of, of issues. The other piece of this is the idea of respectful bridging. So I've heard what you say, 
And what I would like to tell you is that, in fact, COVID-19 vaccines cannot cause COVID-19 because you're only getting the spike, you're getting the instruction on how to generate the spike protein. So again, the bridging respectfully is acknowledging the perspective, not dismissing it. Oh, I hear what you're saying, but that's completely wrong and crazy. You do that and the conversation's over. What you do instead is I hear what you're saying. I've heard other people say something similar. And in fact, what the truth is, is this. And you land on your fact. And in case you're wondering, you can always land on one of these five key messages if you're talking about COVID-19 vaccines. You can stop the pandemic by getting COVID-19 vaccines and boosters. They are safe and effective. They are free. They may have side effects, but those are normal signs that your body is building protection. And then you should still consider wearing a mask in crowded spaces, even after getting vaccinated. Because again, remember, vaccines are not a force field around us. So my last slide here is just some common myths and misinformation that our outreach team continues to hear as they're out engaging with the community of COVID vaccines causing infertility, deaths being miscounted and or overinflated, population control mechanisms. There's a microchip, which I mentioned before, um, COVID vaccines will make you sick. And then a most recent one is this idea that the boosters are actually driving new variants. I thought that was an interesting piece of information there. So I'm going to finish there, and what I'd like to do if I can, but maybe I'm not allowed, is what myths or misinformation are you hearing in your conversations with your patients, with your community that you're serving? And then I will stop and thank you so much for joining us today, and I look forward to the discussion. Oh, thank you so much for that excellent, excellent and very clear overview. Um, and I appreciate the comments in the chat. Uh, Dr. Fernandez Falcon has shared with us um, the website healthychildren.org as being a reliable source of information. That's also been endorsed by Dr. Daniel Dean. Um, and I see a question from Yolan Parrot, excuse me if I've mispronounced your name, who, who says, with flu vaccine release, has there have there been myths surrounding COVID vaccine and concurrent flu vaccines? So um, who on our panel of experts would like to address that question? It's very, very similar actually to the case that we have coming up today. Um, and it was in the Q&A part, so I suppose it's fair game to toss it to our presenter, Jason Rosenfeld. So I, I know what our outreach team has been hearing as they're out uh, working with community and community organizations is that there's fears and concerns about getting the vaccines at the same time. Um, can I get my COVID-19 booster or doses at the same time as I get my influenza shot? And the answer that we always promote is yes, right? So, you know, the recommendation is maybe do one shot in each arm just so that you can save yourself the pain of having one arm overwhelmed and it also can help uh, the delivery of the vaccine itself. Um, but those are the most common things that we're hearing is that you shouldn't do them together because there may be a problem with them. But from, from the evidence, um, there there is no counteraction between the two and you can in fact go get your two doses together. As always, I invite people to continually put questions in the chat as they occur to you and please feel free to share misinformation and disinformation that you are hearing currently. We really try to learn from each other and if we can understand from our community of healthcare providers, uh, patient facing professionals, what you are hearing nowadays that can help us prepare our misinformation inoculation. So please keep those comments and suggestions in the chat coming. And I see a raised hand from Ms. Veronica Atier. Again, I hope my pronunciation is okay. Uh, please unmute. No, to worry. Thank you very much. Uh, well, general thing, I live in Mexico and I would love to ask Jason, what can we do? Like I'm a science communicator, I'm a scientist as well. So I find that when it's a one-to-one, -one, there's no so much trouble because you do have the time to listen to people. But when we're doing it through, you know, webinars or when we're approaching even schools, it's very, very hard because people are just close to this. Uh, unfortunately, our government has been denying even the pandemic now. Uh, but the worst bit is that they were saying for a long time that children didn't get uh, any problem with COVID, that they wouldn't even be, uh, you know, they, they wouldn't be contagious. Uh, and the biggest problem is they even uh, seeded some doubt on the vaccines. 
So it has been a real trouble because uh, we have been going even through legal instances for children to be vaccinated. And even then we've been blocked by the government itself to get them vaccinated. So you can imagine what is going on through the mother's minds, you know, mothers and fathers are just doubting the vaccine. And the more we talk to them, you know, the more they trust the misinformation and they keep on going back to say, well, the government is saying. So what would you suggest us to, to try to change yeah. these things? Because it's, it's, it's been very tough. Yeah, wow. I, I appreciate it. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I was, I, it, it's a challenging, it's a challenging situation. And I would even submit that we've, we haven't faced that level of difficulty in the United States, but early on in the pandemic, the, the, the lack of coordinated communication and messaging from our political leadership and our public health leadership, I, I think also sowed a lot of the challenges that we're facing now. And so part of what our team has been trying to do and, and part of what's near and dear to my heart in community health promotion is is the long game, right? I know this may not be a satisfactory answer, but it's the long game. It's going and sitting with community and listening to people's concerns. What are they hearing? Where are they hearing it from? Acknowledging that that it's that it while the information in your mind you know is incorrect, you don't tell people that, but it's to then simply say, I hear what you're saying. I can understand that concern. And then provide the facts that you know can play the counter narrative to it, but then also invite the storytelling. I think when you can invite storytelling from community, from people who have an alternative perspective or an alternative experience, then that social dialogue can actually replace the burden on you <laughs> and put it back into the community's hands to then grapple with it. And then you become a facilitator of, well, let's bring the fact into this. This is what I know as fact. Um, and then that that's a, a it's a social process. So I know that that that's the long game it doesn't get you like an immediate shot in the arm that day, but it may in two weeks. Wonderful. Thanks very much. Yeah, I didn't think about that. But yeah, inviting somebody that has doubts to one of these webinars could make a big difference because it's not coming just directly from the scientists. Thank you very much indeed. I wanted to add to Jason's comments, the concept, the very important concept of the trusted messenger. So, and that will be different depending on where you are. So you're telling us that right now in Mexico, the government is the trusted messenger. Um, whereas I would argue that in the United States, um, there's been an erosion of trust in government messengers. So what one size does not fit all, but one thing that does seem to be true across many cultures and in many different countries, and uh, Jason Rosenfeld's uh, work will attest to this, is that somebody who is actually from the community itself and who is a near peer or even a loved one of the person that we are trying to convince, that is the person that's likely to be trusted. Historically, physicians in white coats were, were uh, revered and trusted in the 1940s and the 1950s here in the United States. It allowed us to get polio vaccine out even when the first iteration of the polio vaccine um, at caused polio and caused some deaths. In spite of that, people were able to trust in the messenger who was the person in the white coat. There's since been a tremendous erosion of trust in the white coats and uh, people are increasingly looking more to people in their own communities. Okay. Thanks very much for that. Yes, I mean, we. I'm working with a, a group of pediatricians and the people that are their patients, they are very fine with this, you know, because they do have the trust. But it's the general population that we've been having this, you know, real big fight. Anyway, thanks very much indeed. And I want to add one thing um, to that. And great messages from Dr. Bergeron and, and Dr. Rosenfeld. And also what I see is just that repeated um visits and repeated messaging, because that first visit, you may hear about the disinformation. Yes, and this is what I know. It may not, they may not agree to the vaccine then, but come back the following week, continue talking to them, and then maybe the third week down the line, okay, I will get the vaccine. You're there, they see that you're there consistently giving the same message, and that some, sometimes does assist. You know, what we saw here was anxiety about uh, the information regarding myocarditis after the vaccine. And that was sometimes at the heart of vaccine hesitancy or reluctance, whatever word you wanna use on the part of parents. One thing that we worked on in trying to bust that myth was 
explaining to people what the risk of myocarditis from COVID itself was. And uh, we had made some slides with, that had some graphic imagery that helped to represent risk. And the truth is really that yes, there is a small risk of myocarditis from vaccine. It is especially true for adolescent males, which is not all children. And even though that risk exists, it is much lower than the risk of myocarditis from COVID infection itself. Um, so that's a lot of information to unpack. It's not simple information, but if, if you're in a setting where you have the ability to have that dialogue in that level of detail, that's useful to you know, acknowledge where this concern may have been coming from, myocarditis, but then explaining that the risk of myocarditis is worse if you don't get the vaccine. Um, may I please call on uh, Dr. Veena Prasad? Thank you for joining us. Um, we we're happy to have you. Thank you. Um, I had a comment, uh, Jason, how, um, how much have you come across in terms of uh, messages through WhatsApp? Because this started early on. I remember working with a population of uh, Afghani women, especially. They would say, no, we are getting information from on WhatsApp. Take this tea. You don't want to be taking anything else. This is all about for us to get back, to go back to Afghanistan. So it took some time. So I would sit with them, talk with them, and then uh, say, well, let maybe um, I can reply by WhatsApp to whoever it is and then they may be able to talk with us. So one way of um, spreading news, whether it's, it's right, right news or misinformation or uh, right information is through WhatsApp and many of us are not aware of that. Uh, that is something to keep, um, you know, keep in mind. And also um, uh, later on when the whole community com uh, apartment complex started to get COVID, they were able to, they were the first ones in line to get shots so it takes some work but it can be uh, it can be achieved very interesting so jason and i have both uh, had experience working with whatsapp particularly with our international collaborators right uh, we have collaborators in uh, burkina faso and ethiopia yes. and parts of central america jason thoughts about whatsapp as a vehicle for spreading in good information as a and helping to fight misinformation well, that's the reality, right, is all of these platforms can play both a positive and a negative role. And I think the challenge is that, unfortunately, for right now, the negative voices are winning. And I think part of it is because of levels of creativity that they bring to their messaging, but also because, unfortunately, and this is my take, <laughs> I'll, take I'll put on my citizen of the world hat, we we live in a uh, unfortunately in a time of of fear where everything is kind of we're we're using this fear to generate and and move us towards um decision making so but um your point is correct, right? There are so many communities that use WhatsApp for their primary sources of information and communication. And it doesn't get talked a lot about because it's not really a social media site, but it, 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 it but it is, and it's a communication tool. And so, in fact, one of our, our new team members is looking at how can we leverage WhatsApp to communicate primarily with recently um, arriving immigrants in the United States, because that is their primary form of communication and information gathering. So it can be both a positive and a negative. And I think the, the, the task for us as health communicators and health professionals is how do we bring some innovation and creativity to our messaging so that we can play at the same level that the misinformation and disinformation peddlers are playing. Thank you. Um, Dr. Katie Case, did you have your hand up there at one point? I didn't know. I was just going to say that there was a, a study actually, and I think it was in um, China that that the what uh, WhatsApp was a big um, proliferation of um, uh, mis and disinformation. Um, so, anyways, that I was I was just going to add that that they're that they have started <laughs> started looking at these different forms of communication, um, and of course, you know, there's not um, a whole lot. Um, regulation wise, if anything that can be done about it. Um, but um, just kind of an interesting um, just note that they are starting to recognize, um, I guess, the dangers. Thank you for that. And I, I want to make note that Mia Vento from our hub team has put uh, in the chat the WhatsApp guide to preventing spread of misinformation. So there is a 
website that you can all explore. Please apply the web lit legit test to make sure it is a dot com. All right, heads up. We first notice it's a dot com, but that's a site for uh, us to investigate. We're not putting it in the chat doesn't mean we're endorsing it, um, but but we can all subject it to some scrutiny. Um, I now, I saw... to add to that, Dr. Bergerman, if I could yes. just I think that health confianza and some of those trusted leaders in the community are working on is also giving the pe people in the community the capacity to be able to look at information and is this is this correct information do i need to get some more information but whether this is correct so um what we talk about in the community is where did you hear the where, where did you see the information and uh tell me more about it and let's have a dialogue about it so hopefully they can uh as well, all of us do need to understand and have the capacity to understand whether this is good information, whether this is a myth, or we need to seek other sources on that. Not just one social media site, maybe go to another site and see Thank if there's any information. Thank you, Dr. Kentu. I see a message from, I believe, a Dr. Brent Mittler who says, I hear vaccines don't save lives. They are just a money-making scheme by the vaccine manufacturers. Um, interesting comment. We um, got the very same input from one of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Alex Castro Pena, an infectious disease physician with Gonzaga Medical Group. She was invited to be on our panel today and had to be detained elsewhere. However, she was saying just that. Um, she has heard from her own patients uh, in San Antonio that there is reluctance to go and get the booster now. This is in people who are already vaccinated and maybe boosted once. They don't want to go and get boosted because they've come to believe that this is just a money-making scheme, that somehow the pharmaceuticals are making money off of the government. So um, I'd like to know if there are um, participants in our learning group here that are dealing with this and how are you handling it when you hear it? All right, well, um, while you're thinking about whether you have something to share in this regard, um, I am going to ask our hub team, and um, I'm going to start with Dr. Rosenfeld, and then I'm going to come to Dr. Cantu and Dr. Katie K. Yeah, I, I think, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Midler, for the for that comment and that, that myth, right? And so this is a perfect example of where we may be able to use misinformation inoculation, right? And so you come in with the fact COVID vaccines are free and available to anybody that wants one. You are potentially going to hear that they will cost something and that this is just being used as a money-making scheme for all the pharmaceuticals who, um, whether we right or wrong believe, are greedy and just want more money. Um, the fallacy here is, is that basically feeding into that fear and concern that we already have that all pharmaceuticals care about is their bottom line and not really the health and well being of our populations. The truth is, you will not pay for a COVID 19 vaccine. Now, the caveat, as we were talking about before, and this is not a big caveat, you may, your insurance may get charged a small administrative fee for delivering for, for the either the pharmacy or the clinic that you go to to receive. The vaccine, you as an individual patient will not pay for a COVID-19 vaccine. Does anybody have follow-up questions about that or additional information to share with us about, I think it's a very real concern. I, I think people have a lot of information overload in addition to the mis and disinformation that seems to be out there. And now we have some slowness in uptake for the newest booster, which really could help head off a ugly surge and a lot of illness and death in the vulnerable population in this winter, um, but, but slowness in uptake of that Omicron bivalent booster. All right, well, we, um, we did have the case. Uh, Dr. Cantu, um, I wasn't going to put up the case the way we normally do because we kind of addressed the issues and your case was right from the trenches. You're out there, you're vaccinating and all of the 
um, hard to get to places where people have poor access and lots of barriers to their health. And in those venues, you are hearing that people are reluctant to get the COVID and the flu shot together. Uh, were there any other points you wanted to bring out? I think we had a great discussion about that. And I think uh, what I have been doing is the same thing that we've been discussing here is communicating about the safety uh, of getting both vaccines at the same time. Your body is going to create a immune response to each vaccine at the same time. There may be some of the soreness, the arms will be sore. I also do recommend uh, uh, drinking a lot of fluids as you, uh, as you get the vaccine for maybe the next 24, 48 hours. Tylenol, if you feel any ache, any, um, uh, any low grade temperature you might have, those are some things you can do to take care of yourself after getting the vaccine, but reassure that it is safe to get them. I'm here. And the important thing is I'm here with both vaccines as well. And uh, talk to, uh, speak to the convenience of that. Here they are, give them both to you at the, at, uh, at the same time. And you won't have to go to Walgreens, CVS, or to your provider to get them at a different time. You're here right now. So, and then okay. the advantage too that because flu, when it, when the diseases start, they're so similar. It's really hard to tell, right? So if you, you don't protect so. yourself against the flu and you get the flu, you're going to be worried you had COVID. Yeah. Um, but if you get vaccinated against both, you decrease your risk for both. I, I thank you, Dr. Cantu, so mm -hmm. much. And I want to go to Dr. Tess Barton if she's able to unmute. For our audience, uh, Dr. Barton is a pediatric infectious disease specialist and a wonderful communicator. Would you would you like to share your thoughts? <clears throat> Um, sure, I don't know if you can hear me, but but I, I just basically put in the chat that like some of the issues with, you know, like the pharmaceutical companies making money, you know, on this, like it's that's not entirely untrue. Right. <laughs> um, and and I think and, and myocarditis is not entirely untrue. And so I think that when people express those those reservations, I think a big inroad is, is really just acknowledging like, yeah, you know, like it's. It's true, the pharmaceutical company may be making money on that, but it doesn't negate the overall benefit to you as the individual or to our community for, for going ahead and doing it. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, I think that that's just my, it's one of my tools that I use when I'm discussing it with patients. Not always successfully, of course. But. Thank you. And, and Tess, in your role as a pediatric infectious disease specialist, have you heard any other new myths uh, emerging or evolving? Um, no, I haven't. I haven't heard that. Mostly it's been the same ones, but I do, will tell you on the, on the, what I hear most from parents still is that they, they want to wait until they get more information. Like they, they want they don't feel like we know enough yet about about this vaccine and children and the problems and and that's very difficult for me because um, you know on the one hand that is true you know like again we we do have limited you know official clinical trial data although of course we have you know clinical experience in in millions and millions of doses being given to children and the and the safety related to those. But when it comes to boosters, you know, this like if, if somebody, it's hard to stand on legs of saying, oh, yeah, well, there's a clinical trial, like a very, very small clinical trial um, that actually to demonstrate, you know, safety and, and effectiveness. And so um, I do try to rely on that we, we know that, yes, this was rolled out rapidly. Yes, we, we began without, without long-term information, but at this point, we've gathered a lot of information um, and, and we have good experience with it to, to know that the vaccine is safe for children, um, that they're effective in children, but there's still some times you're like, well, I just don't wanna wait and see. And, and, and what I'm often tempted to ask families is what, what is it that you want to see? Like, what is the piece of information that would help you to feel more comfortable with that? Um, it almost seems ironic because um, people who study this and write about it are telling us that the, there's misinformation, disinformation, and information overload, i.e. too much information. And so we hear that and we believe it. And then when we ask the patients, why don't you want your kids to be vaccinated? They're saying there's not enough information. 
<laughs> How does that jive with information overload? So what it means to me is we need to be really smart and not be throwing a bunch of facts at people that they didn't ask for, but really try to zero in on what it is that they want to know and uh, answer their need to know in that moment. I, that has been my personal experience also in the small pop-up vaccine clinics, um, that instead of lecturing people generally about the vaccine and mRNA doesn't go into the nucleus, they don't wanna know that. They have some specific thing they wanna hear about. Uh, and the more specific we can be in the answer, I think the better off we are. One thing too for that, I, I in the community in these pop-up clinics is talking to parents about I, how how uh, how caring they are because they do want to understand the safety of this for their children. So certainly applaud them for wanting for questioning that and having a dialogue for that as well. So acknowledging their fear and I love that. I, I love the idea care. of of um, affirming a parent for being careful. Um, that's, that seems like a really helpful way to build the bond of trust, right? Because that's the other thing you're trying to do. Um, Ms. Beverly Watts Davis, thank you so much for raising your hand. Would you please speak? Yes, uh, and Dr. Gordon, thank you guys for, for having this constantly for us. I was just thinking about the um, what you all had talked about in terms of reaching people. One of the things that we have done both at Ella Austin and Westcare um, we worked in conjunction with um, Dr. Diana Burns, who many of you all know, and in doing the COVID copper, we literally got over 8,000 people vaccinated. But that was really, really, I, I want to just say, if I could say two words, it's really called credible messengers, because we were on the phones with people. And Dr. Bergen, you're right, there's a lot of information out there, but it's not necessarily what people want to know. It's, it's, it's in those conversations. What they want to know is, and, and I can share this with you all, uh, I'm hoping that this is safe where they would honestly say, is this a ploy for, because we were talking most specifically to um, black, to Hispanic and African-American communities. And there was great distrust and still is about the vaccination. So it's, it's, it's really about who's offering uh, a lot of that. And we found that on the East side, just, just great trepidation, but people really wanted to know. So if, if I get sick, you know, is, is this something that, um, who, who do we go to? Like people thought if they got vaccination somehow, they had, to, they had to then be going to somebody different than their own home doctors. I know we're sitting on the phone thinking, why would people think that? But that really was something that came up a lot. So if I'm getting, do I have to now go someplace different? And the answer to that obviously was no. But the other thing was, is people kept asking how, how long does this last and what other and how it mixes in with any other medications i'm not sure why people th thought this vaccination somehow was something different probably because of all the hoopla and everything around covid and people dying but it was like so what else can can i now not take my meds you know some of my my heart medicine or something they really and and we have to remember you know we're talking to people in many of our communities who we have generational poverty we have a lot of people who are not, um, we dealt with a lot of people who they um, w didn't have um, a level of education, it was less than eighth grade in their, in their home. So their questions were, were real. And, and it was just very interesting how many of the same questions we got about misunderstanding. And I, I just think we just really need to hone in the information. There is a lot out there and, and that we really have to figure out a credible messenger delivery system because people see this as very, very, it's a personal decision. Um, they, you know, and, and I will say there's great distrust, particularly among the African-American community, they're great distrust about the vaccinations. Very wonderful, insightful remarks. Um, and thank you, for, and this is a safe space. I think everybody really appreciates um, your insights. I think then we, we all wonder how can we do a better job of, of equipping the credible messengers with the information they need um, and other resources they may need to get out there and spread the messages. And you know, I, one answer we believe at, at Health Confianza is um, our community health workers and yes. making sure that the community health workers are coming from the neighborhoods that we're trying to reach. Yes, outstanding, that's uh, absolutely. Dr. Bergen, and that's really very, very key. And I'm so glad to see 
the community health worker project expand because I think that people, when they see people in communities, they're walking up their doors. We did a lot of block walking. We went door to door to, to a lot of people in our community. And that really helped people believe that it was important and that it was safe. And, and if I might just add one other thing, it's uh, I, I will talk about CHWs all day and every day for the rest of my life. Natural leaders, our faith leaders, our school leaders, right. all of these individuals who are already having conversations with people and who may not feel equipped to navigate the sometimes difficult conversations. The, those are the other folks that we're really looking to collaborate with, support, and and enhance their ability to have those conversations. Because the reality is right now, we don't have the level of CHW um, workforce that we need, but we are working to address that. So, Very good. I, I had one other thing to pick up on from you, Ms. Beverly. Um, sometimes Sometimes we do hear things that seem unimaginable to us, like what the heck, <laughs> what the heck are you thinking that you can't take your antihypertensive because you got the COVID shot? Um, it's just important to pause and mention that uh, our tone and our reaction and our facial expression when we're receiving that from yes. somebody who's in front of us is so yeah. important. And in, in the minute your face shows that you are disdainful of what somebody else believed, um, that that is the instant that the trust is broken and, and then whatever message, positive message you have is not going to go anywhere. All right. All right. I'm quick, seeing Dr. that. We, yes. I Jason? was just going to say, it just but real quick, it makes me think of the big decisions training we got. It's a reproductive sexual health education curriculum. You're going to get questions from young people that can be challenging. And they always trained us the minute you go, <gasps> the minute they've won because they've gotten your reaction. And so it's this, it's the counter to this. It's right. Because the minute you respond in that way, even if your words say the other thing, you, you've potentially put yourself in a hole. So I, I just wanted to share that quick <laughs> nugget. And, and Dr. Luz Garcini, uh, who speaks to us about uh, cultural awareness and clinical communications, um, would talk about unconditional positive regard, right? So that's the mindset. That, that we need to have when we're inter, interacting with people is that we are here with unconditional respect and positive regard um, as a basis for our relationship. All right, now, this has been a robust discussion. I loved every minute of it. I feel like I got smarter today um, from the input of our learning community. And that is intentionally, that is what the ECHO is for, the all teach, all learn environment. We also wanna reiterate, please send us your cases. They can be from Mexico, <laughs> wherever our community of learners is coming from. Uh, there is a case report form. There is a link that has been put into the chat by our UT ECHO IT Carly to everyone. Uh, please make note of that link anytime. There's no bad time to send us a case and we welcome those and we will use them in our next echo. And our next echo, I'm going to pass the microphone over to my colleague, Dr. Raquel Romero. Thank you very much, Dr. Bergen. And I want to just mention that, yes, this is a very special space for all of us to learn together and share experience. We would like to hear from you. Uh, please share your cases from everywhere, like Dr. Bergen says. And thank you so much for moderating the session today. Thank you, Dr. Cantu, uh, Dr. Rosenfield, and to you all to, to share your comments. Next session is gonna be October the 28th, and the topic is gonna be uh, Long COVID and Post-COVID Syndrome by Dr. Monica Verdusco. Um, the information about the CME, CNE Credit Genetic Continuum Medical Education is in the chat. But uh, you need to text the activity code for today, which is 1009 It's a two steps. Please follow up the information in the in, in the chat. And um, thank you. Thank you very much for joining our session today. And please join us in our next session. Um, I promise it's gonna be very, very informative and it's gonna be at the same time, <laughs> in the same, the same area. So Please join us and until then, I hope you are doing wonderful and have a rest of the day.